fun. <laughs> so hi, everybody. I'm showing that we're live on Facebook. I am going to give folks just a few minutes to find us. So uh, please make sure that you're getting, getting yourself settled in whatever way might feel nourishing for you. Uh, it's it's nice on a lot of these live casts, right? I see people curled up with their, well, actually, I don't see you on live casts, but I'm referencing a lot of Zoom trainings I do. I see people curled up with their jammies and their tea or their coffee and their kitty or their dog. So feel free to do that. Or if you want to be painting or drawing or, or writing while we're chatting, hey, this is the right kind of live cast for that. So I'm going to give folks just a minute or two to find us, and then we will officially get started. Kathy, how's the weather in Louisville? To, you're in Louisville, right? Probably the Louisville. same as Ohio. I'm looking out yeah. the window and this is what's going to drive me nuts more than anything else. And probably you have the same sensations, the gray Midwest sky. Totally. Because we haven't had any storms really of any large size, which knock on wood. Okay, that's good. But that clears the sky and right. we're not getting the blue sky. So yeah, I that's that's what's going to contribute, I think, to a lot of people's sense of desperation during these this re-entry period in the pandemic. Of yes, we 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 in the Midwest know this one because Louisville is is yeah within just, shouting distance of you. Totally, I was just going to ask: Is it Louisville or Louisville? Because I've heard I it both go, ways. Louisville, Louisville is really the way you pronounce it, but. Right. I'm trying to go down the middle so that people will think like, oh, Louisville. <laughs> the middle path, the middle path, the middle if you will. Path. So yeah. welcome everyone to today's mm -hmm. noon Facebook live cast here on the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. I'm Dr. Jamie Marich, and I am thrilled to be joined by someone I consider to be a legend of expressive arts mm -hmm. therapy, the expressive arts movement, and that's Dr. Kathy Malchiotti, who's joining us from Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, Kathy, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Jamie. We have to use our doctors. Right? Well, especially as, as women now and yes. that being under threat, I'm, <laughs> I'm down with that. So uh, I, I know a lot of people watching are familiar with your work, uh, but for those who are not, I'd, I'd like to hear, and I would like to, I always like to hear about people's journeys, yes. even if I yeah. kind of know the nuts and bolts of it. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your, your artist's journey and yeah. how it's led you to doing the work you're doing right now. I think all of us that are in what we identify as expressive arts or expressive arts therapy have had interesting foundations. I mean, that's what I come to in all this. Although, you know, many people come to it from mental health into more expressive methods. But, but I think in my generation, I was more typical. I started out in visual art. And uh, I did that because actually somebody told me I couldn't write. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I've done a lot of writing since then. I, For sure. I'm a writer in recovery. Uh, but so I went into visual art, which was great, and, and went to art school. Went to school in uh, Boston at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Really nice uh, environment to just really study and immerse in art. But, like, I, you know, when you go through a program like that and you have instincts around wanting to work with people and also personal experiences i think with art as a healing force in your life mm -hmm. just being a studio artist which i did for a while was not satisfying it's also very isolating you know you're mm -hmm. by yourself really in the studio a lot you may be in an artist group but you were spending a lot of time by yourself so then I got into from that, which happens to a lot of studio artists, we get into teaching. Uh, and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. But my, I think my perspective on, on teaching, I, I taught uh, younger children and adolescents and some adults, is always what was really going on with them through their art. And, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't analyzing, but I noticed that the same kind of thing that I was experiencing with the health giving properties of, of being immersed in the arts. And I should say too, you know, when I was an art student, it wasn't just visual art for me. Now, many people mm -hmm. that go to art school, it is like painting mm -hmm. or printmaking or something. I was taking classes in performance art. I was doing conceptual art. So I was doing a lot of things that were more dramatic enactment. So they were multi-dimensional, but I didn't know how all this was going to play together. So to me, 
visual art was doing a certain thing for me, but all the movement and action and enactment and role play and improvisation were, were all filtering in too. So I had a maybe a different experience in some people that eventually, like I did go into art therapy mm -hmm. as an area of study. So, you know, some of my colleagues that they did the same pathway, but they didn't have that piece where they were involved in performance and movement and all mm -hmm. of that. So I think that naturally over the years took me in this trajectory, thank goodness, because I think it's actually a much more valuable way to work. That's just my biased opinion <laughs> that getting I all of those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're going to agree. I got, a, <laughs> I, got a few, I got a few of those biased opinions, too. Yes. Yeah, but I, I, you know, and I think, okay, so I had this bias, but also the people that I was working with, and it was mostly traumatized populations. I just fell right into that after graduate school with domestic violence, working with children, working with adult survivors, working with sexual abuse survivors, then working a little bit in medical with people mm -hmm. that had cancer and terminal illnesses, the AIDS population, mm -hmm. all of that filtered through that I needed not to just get them making images. They needed right. movement. They needed to enact. They needed multi-sensory things to start to really that repair process and that restoration of the self. Because part of what I see in this, uh, in trauma in particular, what I first learned decades ago with children, I thought, like, why, why can't they play? These children mm -hmm. that I was seeing, they had no mm -hmm. ability to play. I mean, I'd start to be playful because I was very playful as, as that performance piece and the improv mm -hmm. piece. And they'd just be like fascinated. And I'd think like, why can't you come along with me? And they, they couldn't. They were frozen in those body sensations, the aliveness was robbed from them. They had to all, they also learned to be quiet because being right. playful and out there might attract attention that could mm -hmm. be adverse to them, you know, physically uh, and assaultive in some way. So that to me became one of those guiding factors in thinking, you know, we really need to get people enlivened through the arts and it has mm -hmm. to be the arts. It can't be just the silo of, okay, you know, do some drawing, painting, that can be very self-regulating, but it isn't enlivening. So, you know, so that yes. was kind of this pathway. And for yeah. people listening who are not aware, so much of what defines expressive arts therapy is its multimodality, its mm -hmm. intermodality, this willingness right. to uh, all of the above, integrate, play with the different expressive forms. Because it, when I think of my artist's journey, uh, it was music and dancing and writing mm -hmm. for me as a child. Uh, they just interacted, uh, both being a, a music performer, a connoisseur of music, a dancer being on stage so much. Uh, yeah, it, it was like, well, how do I pick just one when I was thinking right. of how do I integrate the arts into, into clinical work? And uh, I started as a teacher and I found that in teaching uh, and even though I did teach drama and speech, and then also uh, teaching in Bosnia after the war, it was just so much more fulfilling, both for my students and me to mm -hmm. teach English, not just through worksheets, but through things like yeah. plays and music and putting all of that on. So yeah, once I got into the professional helping fields, it's like, well, I can't pick just one art mm -hmm. or dance mm -hmm. or wh whatever. And the joke I like to make is that visual art is actually my weak link. Like I, I, I shouldn't say that. I ought not say that anymore because <laughs> it's, it's not about judging the performance. I would say visual <laughs> art is the one I had traditionally judged myself to be the worst at because I stunk at art class, you know, when I was a kid. But I found that visual arts ended up having the most to teach me because all of these other forms I had mentioned, I had some kind of competency-based relationship with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was never the case with visual yeah. art. And yeah. so I, I'm just a fan of the interplay. I know you're a fan of the interplay. And something that we really wanna talk about during this live cast today is kind of the danger of just silos in general, yeah. whether it be the silos people can get, in, get into within just other creative arts fields. But I think a bigger issue we want to tackle is kind of the crisis in the, the helping professions in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Kathy recently uh, wrote an absolutely beautiful article on Psychology Today that when I read it, 
uh, we were just joking before we got on live. I was probably one of the choirs she was preaching to with this article. Oh, yeah. We have on uh, ex expressive arts therapy, the original psychotherapy. Uh, and this just aligns so much with what I do in the redefined therapy hashtag and what I have kind of put out there with dancing mindfulness that, hey, <laughs> yeah, we, we got our professional training, but is that really where it's at? Yeah. So Kathy, tell yeah. us a little bit about your, just your inspiration for this article. I'm going yeah. to go ahead and share it in the, the chat as well. Yeah. But let me let me back up first. I'm, I, Go ahead. I, I'm glad I'm even remembering this because sometimes short term memory flies out the window in these conversations. But you mentioned the silos and I want to just go back to that because I think this is part of, of the whole uh, going back sure. to the article. But yeah, I think for people that are listening, you know, there are some people that are listening or are already involved in expressive arts training in some way or they may be involved in one of the silos. And mm. the silos have come about, uh, I think, very unfortunately, as an economic financial uh, uh, kind of a, a factor in selling graduate programs. And mm. this, to me, uh, then with the whole lot notion that I think we have to do multiple arts in multiple senses, is is a very hard sell right now because it, in order for people in these training programs to start to shift their focus it means giving up that silo and all those silos have individual credentials mm -hmm. and what annoys me the most i'll just come right out and say it is the price tag the price tag mm -hmm. for many of these graduate programs particularly in art therapy are a hundred thousand dollars in tuition alone mm -hmm. And we have a pandemic now, we've had recessions in this country, we, there's a lot of economic challenge for many, many marginalized populations that these programs uh, want to have as students to go out as practitioners, but I don't see how this is sustainable. So that's one thing that really <laughs> annoys me about mm -hmm. how knowledge is transmitted and, and both of us do independent training. And I think right. in part, I'm gonna guess you do that also for the same reason I do. I can make it accessible to so many people. It's not about like, okay, I, I, I want like a huge amount of people to follow this or, or learn this because you know I believe in it or I developed it. It, it really is about accessibility for me. Because to me, it's accessible that. and practical. Yeah. Practical, yeah, and practical. Is, yeah. is very important. Yeah, because the academic, and I'm not you know, saying that what's taught in academia is not valuable, but it generally isn't very uh, geared to the practitioner. So you know, when people graduate, then they're out in another world of like trying to figure out, like, now what do I do with some of this very academic material? The, the practical um, aspects are usually not taught unless it's by someone who comes in as maybe an adjunct and, you know, and, and has a certain way of practicing. And the students are lucky enough to encounter that kind of an individual. Supervisors usually are people they learn from. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this system, I think, I don't know how it's going to change, but higher education will change. So that mm -hmm. that's one thing. There, there have been, there's this buildup almost like a, uh, an ever rolling snowball down the hill where you must get a credential, you must get licensed, then you must maintain right. that. And then, then the standards are upped. Um, this is not sustainable, but it's also not sustainable because I think there's a growing understanding. I think, you know, we're not seeing it quite, quite at a groundswell yet, but I think we will, that expressive methods with this multi-sensory kind of approach is really much better for the person, the patient, the client, mm -hmm. whatever, however you define that individual that mm -hmm. you work with, that you will never get to all the things that that individual might find as restorative if you just stay in one silo. So, Correct. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a big part of my teaching that what I like about expressive arts is it's a buffet, it's a menu. Mm -hmm. And as trauma-informed professionals, it empowers us to help meet people where they are while also then offering them the opportunity to be challenged, to step yeah. out of the comfort zone, like, like, like visual art was for me. Uh, there, I just love giving people options. I always say that a, a, a feature of trauma-informing anything is about giving people options. 
And yeah. I think we, we definitely have that in expressive arts and also what expressive arts, I'm glad you've emphasized the idea of being multi-sensory so many times. We as people are more than just one thing. We are yeah. more than just one channel. And so to, to work with folks in as integrated a manner as possible is, is just absolutely necessary. So yeah. uh, let's, yeah. let's go to the, the field. <laughs> in general, yeah. because the, the article that I, I had just re referenced a, a minute ago with um, uh, that was published on Psychology Today really as essentially an open criticism to the evolution of psychotherapy yeah. conference, yeah. Which, which just happened. It's a conference yeah. I've been at, I've, I've attended. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and Kathy and I uh, have, have kind of a Facebook messaging friendship, just kind of venting our frustrations <laughs> about the state of the field. And I know, and I've shared this with my students, like even one of my big frustrations is with due respect, to writers like Bessel van der Kolk and Gabor Mate and Peter Levine, it's like, mm, are we only paying attention to trauma now because white men are telling us it's important? Yes. Versus yes. like, what about what Judith Herman and Chris Courtois, and this is even we're just staying in like mainstream trauma and work. Alice Miller. And Alice Miller, thank that you for one. bringing, she was the first really? book I read in, right, in the right. whole embodied I, movement, yes. I fault myself for not <clears throat> recalling that until more recently and thinking, Oh my gosh, she talked about how trauma impacted the body. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, she didn't have the neuroscience that's out there now, but she was mm -hmm. saying the exact things that are being said now. So three, right. not many decades, three decades later, she was saying this already. And, and I can't believe that some of the people that are writing today did not know about that. <laughs> you know, I have to go back and look at some of that literature and think, you know, did you cite this? Did you even mention it? But I, I've, I've been accumulating quotes from her. So, you know, those of you that are listening to this, if you're working in trauma and uh, yeah, if you're, you're a young person coming into this, go and look at Alice. Alice Miller, Miller most yeah. definitely. Look her up, the books are still available. The drama, The Gifted Child. Um, and The Body Never Lies. The that body was the first yeah, one I read, yeah. Yeah, so it's right there. But you know, when uh, this year, when uh, I think I received an advertisement, I can't remember a few months back about the evolution of psychotherapy conference, I must be on the mailing list because I have attended in the past when it's been live. And of course mm -hmm. they went to virtual. And I know uh, the person who organizes it, uh, Jeffrey Zeig, who, uh, you know, I've known him for years. Uh, I don't think he remembers me very well, but he was with a publishing company that helped me publish my first book way back. So this was three decades ago. So that book was strictly on art therapy and domestic violence children that were from violent homes, so to speak. Uh -huh. So, you know, I just thought I'm going to write to him and just ask. I'm looking at the program and I'm not seeing expressive of any kind, you know, the implicit, the kind of thing with expressive arts or something around that. It's not in this program. And then I look back even from this program, of course, was 2020. I look back at 2017 and I think the other one was 2013. You could still find this on a Google search. Absolutely just about the same presenters. Um, mm. So going back seven years, and I thought, there has been quite a bit of change over this decade, and there's some other things besides, and some of these people, I thought, well, I haven't seen any recent publications from them. They're kind of people mm -hmm. that were from back then, and maybe mm -hmm. even beyond that. But I asked them straight up about, um, you know, why isn't expressive arts a psychotherapy, <laughs> according to this conference? I, you know, he had a decent answer, but I, I don't think he knew exactly what I was talking about either. He wasn't mm -hmm. really familiar with what we're familiar with as people practicing it and reading about it where we can find information about it. So I thought, huh, I, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's not, in my mind, you're saying it's not equivalent as a form of psychotherapy. And this is the drum <clears throat> I've been beating for a while, and I'm going to beat it a lot louder this year, uh, because I think one thing we I talk about when I have to go speak to groups where I know a lot of the audience is going to be medical, neuroscientists, psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be our tribe. It's going to there'll be a few people there, but the majority mm -hmm. is going to be coming from a science point of view. 
Mm -hmm. I can't present them with a lot of the kind of the research that they want. It's some of it's coming about, but you know, and, and there are some things that can be said now from some quantitative studies and qualitative Mm -hmm. studies, but the real evidence for expressive arts is cultural anthropology and ethnology, which are also forms of research. And that's how I, yes. Yeah. That's how I come in because I think, this that for me is a credible way to enter a dialogue with them and they have paid attention to that they're starting to pay attention but I don't think a lot of okay so my core tribe the art therapists they're really trying to prove through the brain the brain Mm -hmm. the brain the brain about how art therapy works Mm -hmm. okay I get it you know you're trying to establish research and all that Mm -hmm. But actually the data exists because for thousands of years, these practices, and they still are being used around the world in in Mm -hmm. the same way that they were used thousands of years ago to address trauma, Mm -hmm. address loss, address the body's distress, address whatever is considered mental illness, however you want to define that, and physical illness too. So uh, those practices are there. Uh, we in our fields now are looking more at how we have appropriated some of that. That's a, another discussion, but, sure. but we did come from that. And that's human evidence that these things do have uh, worth and effectiveness. Most so, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. If, I, if I could hop on that soapbox, because I think um, a, a common question then that comes up is, is it just that you artists are horrible researchers? And part of it is like, I, I, I would, I personally, for me, I would rather spend my time in the doing and the exploration yeah. than yeah. trying to quantify something that may not necessarily be quantifiable. So part of my person, that's why I'm so glad to hear you mention cultural anthropology, because part of my perspective on this is in my PhD, I was trained as a phenomenologist. I'm a phenomenologist at my soul, which is all about the study of lived experience, which mm-hmm. quite frankly rejects any notions that the human experience can be quantified. And yes, the, the, the randomized controlled trial, experimental yes. design is considered the gold standard. And I, to be very clear, I, I'm a very both and person. I'm a very dialectic person. I'm not anti-science. I don't want any of this to come across no, as that. No, I, I believe- I'm not either. I, believe we need the science and the investigation, but part of that is understanding that psychology and the helping professions, we're not a hard science, we're not a pure science. There's an art in that as well. And I really believe that can truly only be invested qualitatively. And that qualitative research is the most culturally responsive research because so much of the language of the RCT is literally the language of white power, the white man, the the academic structures and institutions. And I mean, I have quite a bit of insight I can offer on this from being involved in the EMDR community, which is an, another mm-hmm. community here, where having quite a big body of qualitative research in that world, I've largely felt like, oh, it's, it's nice to have it, but it doesn't really open the doors like the mm-hmm. empirical quantitative research does. And I've been doing some reading lately that to truly investigate any phenomenon in a culturally responsive way, you really have to get in there and work with and know the people you're investigating. It can't be cold and removed. And I, 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 I've just always felt like I'm a bit of this square peg in a round hole in the world of academics and the world of mainstream yeah. psychotherapy, because I, I've, I'm just inherently seeing things through such a qualitative lens. It's part of how my mind works, part of how my soul works. And I'm, I'm willing to continue to do that research yet I've always felt discouraged because it doesn't feel like it's going to make a difference. Yeah. And so I'd rather get in there and, and engage in the doing that, but that's just my, my story yeah. with it. Well, so, so just a tangent here. One of the things I'm trying to do this year, which I think it will be very exciting. I, I've been uh, friends and colleagues now for about a year with Ruth Lanius, who actually oh, yeah. did a lot of the studies around why did language get shut down in trauma, mm-hmm. you know, and has drilled down into that. She's an MD, but she's also a researcher, a PhD, mm-hmm. scientist, very down to earth and very clear about, mm-hmm. you know, I when I listen to her when she presents these kinds of very quantitative things, mm-hmm. she has a way of bringing in actual cases, right? Mm-hmm. And so it humanizes mm-hmm. it and translates these complex things that, you know, we're, <clears throat> I, well, I'm not so savvy on, 
default network, you know, and mm -hmm. all these different parts of the brain. But the way she explains it, I started, it started to click with me and think, oh yeah, default network has to do with sense of the self, for example. And that's one of the core things we do as expressive arts practitioners is help people discover what their self is and restore their self when they've pushed it away because of addiction or because of trauma or grief or loss or any number of things. So we're trying to do a think tank, which will be interesting because I have a couple of expressive arts and play people, you know, experts in their areas with her research team and to have these cross dialogues about, because both of us think the same thing, like, okay, so she does the science really well, uh, mm -hmm. but how do you translate that? It's often talked about and there's no translation into the practical, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we as practitioners even support that in terms of giving data to the research through our own practices and working with people? So I'm really excited about that. I think by the end of the year, we'll have, um, in mid-year, we'll have something going, but um, by the end of the year, we'll be a lot more clear, like what is that relationship that needs to happen? Because we've seen that in conferences where there's such a heavy scientific program and right. everybody, practitioners are watching it and they're picking up on some things, but they're also like now in Zoom on the chat box saying, I love this, but what do I do with it? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what and, do I do with it? Speaking yeah. of conferences, uh, uh, some of you might not know this story. This is actually kind of how the whole dancing mindfulness movement was born, mm -hmm. where I would go to conferences, specifically mm -hmm. trauma and addiction conferences. And here we are sitting down watching PowerPoints yeah. <laughs> about trauma and the body, but we're sitting on our butts in this very left brain way. And I just very much had this idea, let, let's dance at conferences. And I know it's not original to me because it's certainly at expressive conferences, it's been done, yeah. but I, I've, I've taken it as a, as a great passion to like go into mainstream conferences and do yeah. things like dance yeah. sessions or expressive art sessions. Uh, Cause the whole conference scene is just horribly oh, depressing to me. Well, I was surprised a few years ago when I was given a chance to do a day long workshop at a very heavily um, scientific trauma conference <clears throat> and, and the organizer came in. She was she was she was she wasn't upset. She was like, wow, I was playing Bob Marley, you know, people yeah. were, were drawing and dancing and, and she was like, wow, are you going to do something? I said, yeah, the, the whole day is going to be, you know, this, uh, all kinds of things going on. But you know, I said, I hope I'm not disturbing the session next door <laughs> because I kind of, I kind of have a sorry, not sorry attitude about that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I mean, <laughs> right. yeah. So to us, it comes naturally, but yeah. Uh, and I think it was well appreciated. There were a lot of psychologists and psychology psychiatrists in that audience. And they were participating, which is different than I would say, even I'd say up to 10 years ago, <clears throat> when I would start to have something like this be happening in the day long training. And mm -hmm. these people would get up and leave. <laughs> I mean, they would yeah. go and come back when the PowerPoint came back. On exactly. Because it's yeah. like, oh, you're, you're making me feel things. You're making me yeah. go into yeah. my body. I, I've, I've yeah. dealt with that. So and now, I wanna... now they're staying. So yeah. I, I didn't have any attrition on that. And I thought, well, that's different, you know, and they, right. they stuck it out. I made them do improv and they got up and did that. Um, yeah, I mean, I structure it so that, you know, they're safe and comfortable and it has a process mm -hmm. that they move towards, but still in all, they, they stuck it out and did it. They were, you know, using the musical instruments and, and mm -hmm. practicing, getting ready for their performance. And uh, that was different. So maybe there is a little shift, you know, we can, mm -hmm. we can be hopeful around that. Um, yeah. So I want to go to the title of your article, uh, expressive yeah. arts therapy, you know, the original psychotherapy, mm -hmm. because one of the other components of and you know, of the formal field of expressive arts therapy that I really resonate with is this acknowledgement that the expressive arts are indigenous in origin. The mm -hmm. expressive arts were the first therapeutic modalities that were used on this planet. And I do believe honoring that history is incredibly important. And I know for me, and I'm sure you've gotten this 
you know, snide comment delivered to you over the years too, that in, in my rather insular Northeast Ohio community, people often say things like, oh yeah, Jamie Merritt, she's the hippie therapist, or she's a little <laughs> like granola for my liking, or she does all the weird stuff. And it's like, yeah, you can look at me that way. But I think that's also by saying that, by calling what we do weird, mm -hmm. you are really are insulting the first peoples of this planet. Yeah, yeah, and, no, and really. the approaches and the healing modalities that they use, and so I mean, I'm I'm on full on soapbox yeah. mode sometimes. Like yeah. to to even frame things in that way is a very racist, white centric, Eurocentric oh, worldview, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I do want to talk a little bit because I'm glad you brought up appropriation because there is this idea of how do we honor and give credit where credits due with so many of these practices, mm -hmm. yet um, adapt them to modern American, North American especially, or yep. other European audiences. But even, you know, in my European heritage, um, I'm, I'm Slavic background, several different mm -hmm. Slavic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I have connected so much with my people's indigenous practices with yeah. our inherent practices mm -hmm. of dance and music. So yeah, let's let's just kind of have a chat about that anywhere you want to go with uh, really honoring the roots of yeah. yeah, this is the OG, this is the original, this kind of yeah. work. Well, let me back up here too about w why I was proposing, and I don't think it, it was well understood, I might not have been clear enough about the lack of inclusion of the expressive arts or expressive methods in in you know this very iconic conference that identifies right. what psychotherapy is and and my pitch if i had been able to open up a bigger conversation would have been you know in the beginning language wasn't the real central thing we've been in talk therapy and identifying talk therapy for over 100 years as psychotherapy Mm -hmm. But isn't there a nonverbal form of this, an implicit form in how humans mm -hmm. communicated, moved through, danced through, used sound, uh, even if they did storytelling, there was ritual and enactment and all these other dimensions, even when they were making the images, there might have been singing and drumming. So there were all these components that were implicit. They were mostly body-based. This is where a lot of the body-based people have taken stuff out of here and, and appropriated it to, which is another thread we can go back to. But we'll do another live cast maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would take a whole live cast. Yeah. Um, but my, my pitch is around this is that implicit communication is also a form of psychotherapy. Amen. Whew. That is a radical thought, however, because again, uh, psychotherapy is defined as talk, as talk, as language. But we surely know, and a lot of people who are in the profession of psychotherapy, that talk is not available, talk is not enough. People say all the time, they will continue to say, I, I can't come up for, with the words for this, or, or they're essentially frozen or mute because they can't yeah. express it. So in order, I think, for expressive arts to be understood as a form of valid form of psychotherapy, the whole idea that the body maybe, maybe is even more important than the language in how it communicates. And I sometimes wonder, I have this fantasy conversation with some colleagues about, gee, I wonder, you know, I hope I live long enough or we live long enough to see the time when people say, why did we spend so much time on talk <laughs> you know, as the for central form of psychotherapy? Why didn't we see this as the central thing that led to language? Because even neuroscience says this. Okay, so here's a very mm -hmm. complicated book that I, I just love. I've read it a couple times because it's a very dense book to read called The Feeling of What Happens by Antonio Damasio. Mm -hmm. He got you know many, many scientific awards. Uh, one of the things he has identified is that all stories start as in the implicit part of the brain. They start in the right brain non-language area. They don't start in the language area. They start in the non-verbal area. They start in the implicit, the sensory, and move to language. And I think that's what we do. I realize that with even with art making and just movement and just making mm -hmm. marks and all this, that it stimulated language. It mm -hmm. comes before language still. So right. this is why we have a right to be on this plane equal 
to all the other psychotherapies. We are psychotherapy. We are coming at it though from a different form of communication that is just as valid. And I'm saying maybe in the future, there's gonna be statements like, why, why did we spend so much time trying to get language out of people when we could have started with this other communication, this gesture, this enactment, this right. mark making, you know, and, and right. that is perhaps the lead up or sometimes it's the story. Mm -hmm. It can be the you've seen that over and over that a movement or a sound mm -hmm. making or something that someone does it it's the story you know it yes. doesn't have to have words right and it's interesting that we're going here because I love language I love writing yeah. I'm a very mm -hmm. verbal yeah. person yeah we yet, both do. yeah yet it, it's, it's one of our participants just said here in chat language often gets in the way. Uh, or uh, engaging implicitly can be the genesis, the seed for, mm -hmm. for, for language coming about, that it really is about an integration. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when I think about the, the, the deep definition of healing here, mm -hmm. it is that, I mean, we could look at it as integration if we're kind mm -hmm. of citing Dan mm -hmm. Siegel work, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, from more of the Eastern or yogic perspective, what I've come to understand is this idea that we as, as people are already born inherently whole, but so much of what trauma and life and the human experience does to us is it severs that connection to the yeah. inherent wholeness that we are. And so the practices we engage in either organically for our own healing or the practices that we may learn from a professional or it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional psychotherapist. I mean, I have had the great honor of being worked with by a variety of gifted healers from a variety of different traditions. And it's just about all of them working together mm -hmm. as, again, I'm preaching to the choir with you. Uh, it needs to be said because people are, are listening and this may be novel, you know, a novel. Yeah. And I, I think it's novel to a lot of very effective, uh, uh, excellent psychotherapists you know, mm -hmm. and, and to hear it sometimes helps to click on that part. But, right. Because again, I'm saying here, you know, this uh, Antonio Damasio, who to me, very strictly, and he's not a, a, a psychotherapist, he's a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. that, that kind of person is saying that the implicit communication is where mm -hmm. it starts. So mm -hmm. why aren't we starting there? Well, we, we start there. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a valid way for others instead of trying to follow that trail that I find never really worked, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it could just be me and my personality, but I, I haven't even seen it stick uh, mm -hmm. with people that come back for more help and say, you know, I got something from this, but I couldn't stay with it, you know, because mm -hmm. it was so up in the head and it's I felt outside like, in. Hey, yeah, yeah, I'm just repeating these things to myself to mm -hmm. try to change my behavior, but there's all this other going on. And that's all that implicit communication that was not even addressed mm -hmm. in that. It can't be, it's just not happening that way. So something that non-therapist friends of mine, uh, it, it, they have this mind blown experience when I talk to them about this. When I say not all therapists are really in touch with their feelings or their body, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. so much of therapy is about mm -hmm. the cognitive behavioral. Yeah. Um, I, I've put this idea out there and, and the phrase is not original to me, but I've certainly run with it of what I'm calling feelings phobia uh, or this fear of the body that we tend to have. And I do think a lot of it is an outgrowth of religious conditioning. And this is not an anti-religion slam because I'm all for healthy, beautiful faith. Yet we know that more toxic expressions of faith, because I grew up in two of them, can leave us with this sense of my body can't be trusted. Yeah. Uh, my body's this shameful vessel. Right. Uh, even in Eastern thought, there's a beautiful teaching called disidentification, which is you have your feelings, but you are not your feelings. And I fundamentally agree with that, but people have taken it too far to be like, you know, oh, it's spiritual bypass, like feelings are bad. Like I, I, I have to detach from, from all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think about the messages that people get socialized with in general, uh, like don't cry, 
it's probably yeah. one of the first messages we get as children, right? Mm -hmm. Don't don't cry. And sometimes those messages are very gendered for us. So I'm, I'm curious, Kathy, what, what role have you seen? And I think that's it's alive and well in our field with a lot of the leaders of our field, that there's a real fear to actually go to feeling and sensation. Yeah. And, well, and, and is that something happened. that's culturized? Yeah. Yeah, I think it happens in art therapy a lot. Mm. Um, there's a very uh, strict message there about staying, you know, with the image and hoping that the image will do the work. Mm. And that's not how things <laughs> work in psychotherapy even. Uh, you have to be able to be relational and relational is always going to bring up feelings. You know, even if it's just between you and the therapist in the session, it's going to be, and the therapist is going to have to have feelings too. They're going to be feeling, you know, what's felt by the person that they're working with or the group that they're working with. So, you know, that's probably one of the reasons I got uh, moved away from the way I saw art therapy, because it's, mm. it's more cognitive than any of the other silos, mm -hmm. I think. Um, right. because, and maybe that's even why it took you the longest to get there, <laughs> because it is at that continuum. I, I mm -hmm. find in the continuum of expressive arts, it has a self-regulatory uh, part. So that means getting rid of those uncomfortable feelings and bringing that calm about. And that's OK, except if you look at the chart, which we often call window of tolerance, mm -hmm. you can call it window of capacity. People in art therapy love to drop people down below that capacity or tolerance into that place. It's almost dissociative. Now it's okay to be a little bit out of it for a while and space out. We all need to get away from things sometimes, mm -hmm. but to always live there where you've, you've numbed out all those mm -hmm. things that actually we need to risk feeling is not helpful. Then it, the other end of it goes into uh, storytelling and cognitive and interpreting and symbols and all of this stuff that's highly cognitive so that's not yeah. dropping down into feelings either right. so that's why I always say you know you have to get these other senses in there with that but I think a lot of colleagues that I've known for decades they like to stay in that one silo because it feels safer from those feelings cutting loose and getting out there that are very uncomfortable. Yeah, because those mm -hmm. are the ones that we're struggling with that we haven't been able to master. We haven't even been able to experience. We've kept mm -hmm. them off there, you know, in the image, you know, put it and there. And I've seen and I've seen people be so afraid of feelings that a lot of yep. what the block is about is a fear that they'll engulf me, a fear of what mm -hmm. may come up, a fear that, oh my gosh, I may have to actually change if I encounter them. So just yeah. a real quick pause. Uh, we have quite a few people who've been with us live this whole time. So if you oh, do wow. have a question, if you have a question for Kathy or I, please go ahead and put it in the comments. Yeah, we've had between 30 and 40 people live. And I know a lot of people will watch this on the replay. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, please feel free to go ahead and write it in, in the comments thread. So uh, anything else you feel you wanna cover, Kathy, uh, based on <laughs> what it means to, you know, change the paradigm here uh, well, what would what would the field truly need so so this i've been thinking about for the last three months and actively working on it and actually i'm going to be talking to you more about it not not today but soon <laughs> is how we get the women and marginalized voices more centralized mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. only in what we do because it will probably come from that but in the bigger game that's been going on there where we go and we see, and I'm not saying that anyone who's on these programs over and over and over again hasn't had something valuable to say. Certainly mm -hmm. I have listened to and gotten value from many, many colleagues that are mainstream names repeated over and over again. Uh, it's certainly helped me think through things, but it's been way too long that we haven't heard from the females, for example, in trauma. I, you know, as we mentioned before about Alice Miller and, you know, the people that are still amongst us living that we don't hear about as much, but we have a lot of these figures within our own realm of expressive people who do mm -hmm. uh, the expressive arts or they do one more than another. They're, you know, uh, they're voices that are valid, but 
over and over again, they're not called on in these programs. And I, I say this because going through all these decades myself of sometimes even making it to the panel where I'm the only female identified as a female with four men who have a very good clubhouse relationship. <laughs> I've been put in that situation of, you know, uh, nobody's been mean to me or pushed me mm -hmm. away or anything, but they have their own dialogue that goes on. And, and to get my voice in has, has been taken some energy to do that. Mm -hmm. And gladly I've, you know, been able to be in that role. But I was in a conference <laughs> in November about women and trauma and we were talking about women's issues and trauma but there were all women on it it was run in the uk mm -hmm. uh, and i even said to the person who organized it she's a psychotherapist as well as a continuing ed organizer i said i'm so happy to be on this but even happier that you thought of this and i said how come it's taken as she before i finished my sentence she said yeah when were we going to get to this where you know we could put together two days an array of women's voices only right. uh, you know again not that the men can't be part of the mix but they've been the dominant voice for sure and what for i sure. heard in the presentations i were able to listen to you know, I mean, there there are many different things that will come from that perspective versus uh, the typical white male that has been able to talk and produce and publish and, and be constantly, constantly mm -hmm. on every single program in trauma. Um, and what I found interesting, it even pushed me because um, I, I thought to myself, okay, what am I going to talk about and also get the expressive arts therapy piece in there as a of equal form of psychotherapy. And basically it came down to all that domestic violence work that I've done over the years and still am mm -hmm. encountering about women's voices being silenced and how do we mm -hmm. reopen those voices. And one way is through what we do because yeah. it does involve ways to tell without talking when you're afraid of putting something out there because you really do have safety issues or your voice has been silenced and you don't know what it is anymore. So reintroducing, you know, gesture and movement and vocalization and the image making and, you know, enactment yeah. to try to rediscover that voice, you know? Sure. So that to me was really profound in thinking about, I don't know that there's probably men that are doing really good work with women identified as survivors of assault and violence. However, I think through the expressive arts and, and as a female, I, my, my perspective is deeper. It's deeper. Yes. It just is. So I want to get to some questions because we got some pretty fascinating questions okay. and really a very interesting comment. And this is a comment that I have always echoed that so many of the men in our field are in these leadership positions, but it's overwhelmingly the women doing the line work. And uh, attending the conferences. So, yes. So please listen to that about what you support. And I hope if something gets manifested this year, which I'm hoping that you get behind <laughs> the right. women marginalized and people whose voices haven't been heard as much and not right. decide to spend your money once again on hearing you know the same voices not that they are not you know i'm not saying not good but it's usually we've heard a lot of it it's not going to be yes. particularly new yeah agreed uh, yeah. i'll just you know <laughs> hashtag check agree on that soapbox okay so a couple questions here uh, just a lot of gratitude kathy being expressed you can go back and look at these later for for both of us in the oh, conversation great. so uh what do you recommend as the most effective way to help children connect with the feelings and their body because okay, i already so gave a little bit about how kids can be you know socialized against it how do we help yeah. kids connect well, yeah, I think that that's the thing that's so interesting. And I, I think I talked about this really briefly in that talk I just mentioned is how our bodies get trained uh, not to, you know, like you said, not to cry, don't talk too loud, don't make yourself the center of attention. And sometimes doing things that are really helpful that calm the body, like don't even yawn, you know, don't, don't stretch, don't move, don't do all these things. So 
this is the thing I learned right in the beginning. Now, again, I came out of school and then into art therapy. So I came into my very first job as an mm -hmm. assigned as an art and play therapist with children. And the first thing I find that they don't know how to play, they, they don't feel comfortable with that. Uh, the drawing they were comfortable with, but it, to me, it looked like, oh, I think I'm, I'm, and we didn't use the term freeze then, but I, I mm -hmm. could see them kind of get reinforced in their stillness. And I thought, yeah. this doesn't feel right. And again, I'm just operating, we didn't have the neuroscience and we didn't talk about, we didn't even talk about children's trauma then. We, we, there was a, a party line that my, the team I was on didn't believe, but that children, oh, they'll just forget it eventually. They're resilient, oh, yeah. Wow, just forget it. No, <laughs> but we didn't have the data yet on all that. They weren't even thinking children had post-traumatic stress at that point. Mm -hmm. That really mm -hmm. ages me, but <laughs> that was really what was true. So I just thought to myself, I, I got to get them moving somehow. And I think that still holds true. This is what I think about that. Uh, I always start sessions, you know, in most cases with movement, even on the Zoom platform, that we just Ooh, yep. move and attune together. And sometimes, of course, that's going to be very hard. You get somebody who doesn't mm -hmm. want to make eye contact, doesn't want to mirror, you know, and we have to start mm -hmm. with the simplest of movements, just, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Uh, but getting the body moving before anything else, in a, you know, and, and yeah, I'm just saying I was educated through this art therapy master's program and some play therapy work to drop down into this creating the image mm -hmm. okay the image does serve a purpose there's a purpose for that and most of those children enjoyed that but it wasn't good for where they needed to go to start to enliven their bodies and and to learn how to play again and to be comfortable in themselves uh, you know, so that still is the starting point for me and, and making mm -hmm. sounds, sometimes just making funny sounds together. Do that yeah. a lot now on telehealth. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I should be wearing one of my fun hats. Oh gosh, I don't have for, my hats handy. This, yeah, I have a wizard hat it. I wear sometimes. I so another <laughs> question I want to get to, because I certainly have an opinion on it, and then I want to get your take on it, which is uh, how can therapists who are new to expressive arts begin to incorporate it into their practice? So a big teaching of mine is start the practices for yourself first. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because I, I do believe the best expressive or creative therapist or anybody who is interested in sharing embodied practices like yoga in clinical work, it is has to come from a place of sharing yeah. your practice. Because yeah, you can read stuff from a manual, like Kathy's done manuals and handbooks, I've done mm -hmm. manuals and handbooks, mm -hmm. you know, process not perfection. And yeah, it, it can get you somewhere, but I don't think it's going to help you to be able to modify if you don't have an experience with what it's like to maybe have struggled with some of these practices yourself and be well, able to. See, going back to where we started in the beginning of the conversation and just saying, you know, okay, how did I get to where I got and, and you know, what was my pathway? I am so glad and, and some of my colleagues that came from the same kind of pathway that I didn't start out, because sometimes I say, well, a social work degree would have been really helpful probably to me in the mm -hmm. beginning, but not so much in the fact that I started out in the arts and got that foundation so ingrained in me that it comes as second nature when I started to learn all the psychological and, and all this kind of stuff that you, you do need to know as well mm -hmm. in order to be uh, ethical and grounded and best practices and, and I stay up with all the things that are out there. Um, so that is the harder thing and it's exactly what you said. You know, just become part of some kind of creative group even right now. There's so many of them where you mm -hmm. can participate online and make it a regular practice because you can't look at this as a, a series of activities you're going to learn and then just take them and throw them against the wall and see which one works. You need, to, <laughs> you need to have this sense of how this operates within yourself. And it's not, not going to be the same for everyone, but you start to get that sense of, of what is it like to create a movement? How risky does that feel? You know, what feels comfortable? What do I feel like in space now? You know, right now we're in our own spaceships, but we'll come back to proximity in some point. What is it like, you know, being in 
uh, proximity to other people? What is it like to, you know, make that first mark on paper? You know, what does that feel like? How, how you know, all those things. And then just to keep going with that, whatever it is that resonates with you. Some will resonate more than others, but you have to be grounded in this somehow. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just to take those steps somehow and do that is really key. But again, I, when I'm speaking for myself, I'm thinking, wow, how lucky the way my life unfurled <laughs> and then I, right. I started from that. I was doing a lot of big movement oriented paintings mm -hmm. even and, and, and got this whole uh, foundation and comfort level that way. Other people come and I had to get comfortable with what mental health required that I know mm -hmm. about people. So that was my learning curve, but I'm so glad I started in the practice of all these things it made it much easier yeah and i and I, I think you know as as you said that it's it's reminding me of something i often share and teach which is how diving into the arts is what helped me to survive my home helped me to survive right. my childhood yeah. Yeah. and a lot of it was simply intuitive and mm -hmm. going down into the basement and playing and dancing and, mm -hmm. and, and putting on music and and going with it and and then eventually getting on stage and, and having that outlet. So I yeah. think if, if a person's a therapist is like, where do I even start? I may challenge you to think about, you know, float, float back in your memory. What was something you did tap into when you were mm -hmm. younger that yeah. maybe brought you some kind of joy, even if it was coloring in a coloring book? Kathy, yeah. I can't tell you when I was in my early 20s, I started coloring and coloring books again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, like kids books, it wasn't even the like, technical ones that are out there for adults right now oh, they're too and, it was, <laughs> and it was just a uh a, a connection with some kind of organic joy yeah. that i i had lost and then i got into doing paint by numbers again and from yeah. that i went into full full-on intuitive painting so yeah I, I i think start with something that you you found some joy in yeah. when you were younger or if but, you felt you were cut off from any of that what do you wish you would have had I mean, that's that, part of, you know, a lot of times people say, well, how do you start a session? You know, and mm. I always think there's some miracle thing that I do. Well, when we get going, sometimes we have a ritual that we go through. But in the beginning, when somebody comes in, okay, so one of the things I start with is, you know, where do you want to be in the room? I introduce mm -hmm. them to the room and, you know, next to me, across from me, how far away, all this, you know, so that's a whole piece there. But the other piece is just talking about, you know, because sometimes they'll say, Ah, you know, I, I, I've heard from friends, I, well, now right now I work with quite a few military and, and other, you know, people that they work with will say, I've heard that this is a really helpful thing to do, but you know, I don't know about making art or all this stuff. And mm -hmm. but then we start to talk about what do yeah. you think that is? And I said, and I, I, I said, you won't hear me use the word creative that much. I use the word expressive because I think all people can be expressive. Yes. And creative is a real loaded thing. Walk against it. Yeah. Because yeah, you yeah. think creative has to be original. It's, I wake up I in the morning and sometimes I, I don't feel particularly creative. So I'm confessing right. that to you as your therapist here. I, creativity right. is not always what I wake up to. And I said, we all have something to express, whether yeah. it's yelling at the top of our lungs. Yeah. <laughs> That's an expression. It's, and at some point, you might think you feel creative in all this, but we'll just see how that rolls. But I say, there's probably something I bet you did during your life. We may not remember it today, but think about it between now and the next session that you did, right? That that gave you some kind of joy. And just think of it as, you know, it was hands-on or it was body-based or something that you engaged mm -hmm. in. And I have no problem with that. You know, people coming in, one soldier that I write about in the book, whittling, you know, and mm -hmm. I was like, whittling? I said, I, I, I've heard, you know, I know what whittling is. I've never done that. Tell me about that. I mean, he and his father spent a lot of time sitting, talking, whittling, and they were quite good at it. I mean, they could take a stick and turn it into a, a lizard or an animal, you know, As, and, and they, but he never thought like, oh, you know, that's something really expressive that I do. Mm -hmm. Some people garden, uh, you know. Absolutely all kinds of different things that come into this. And as you open that door for people, so that's that's what people out there, if they're thinking, I, I don't know if I have, I, yeah, you do, you do. There's something that you do that uh, even, you know, if somebody came, they, they do a very artistic arrangement of photos. They love to work with photos and put them together in different ways. And like, 
Wow. I had that actually a lot with uh, when I worked with uh, HIV and AIDS patients yeah. uh, for many years, that that was one thing because sometimes the physical capabilities were not there, mm -hmm. but they could, they could arrange images and create stories from images. And, and uh, so there's, there's so many pathways, but yeah, you have to start, you know, silly phrase, start where you're at. Right. And yeah. we're coming up to the, the top of the hour and we have to wind yep. down. I am sharing Kathy's websites in the uh, uh, comments here on the live cast and I'll make sure that I put them on the YouTube video that'll come up later. Uh, yeah. if, if you did not <laughs> miss this or miss this whole thing, you can rewatch the replay here on Facebook. I'll have a YouTube link up here in a few hours that will go along with this video. So please feel free to share if others in your circles would be interested in this conversation. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. And then uh, you could find me just about anywhere online. <laughs> just uh -huh. search it's not my hard name. to find Dr. Jamie. <laughs> yeah, the, the, different, the different programs will come up in the different books and, and all of that. Uh, so this has been an absolute delight. And uh, something you were, you were, when you were talking about veterans, uh, we have a, I have a friend in, in Tennessee who's a veteran and he does dancing mindfulness strategies with his mm -hmm. folks, with his guys. And uh, mm -hmm. I asked him what his secret was. And he said, I just let them use the music they want to use. Yeah. So we do dancing mindfulness with slasher metal. And I'm like, I love that. Cause I've always taught from the beginning mm -hmm. of my dancing mindfulness work. If, if we believe that mindfulness can be practiced in any realm of human experience, why not bring in any type of music mm -hmm. in order to facilitate this, these, these shifts or these engagements? So yeah. yeah, people find their ways. And I think that's the other thing about that I like about expressive arts and even the field of expressive arts therapy, as small as it is, then I think we've been more attuned to that about encouraging people to find their way through this that you know we're here with them but that's not the end game we want them to be able to manifest this on their own you know and even be a support to others through it most definitely uh, so that's what i love about it i think it, it again as a form of psychotherapy it's not saying it's uh behind in the ass psychotherapy you know you're sitting in the chair <laughs> really well uh, let's, let's do this again sometimes we can both wear our wizard hats or mm -hmm. our, our our fun hats and uh again Kathy, <coughs> thank you so much for being with us today yeah thank you it's fun hour went by really fast